I feel a lot better than I did the last time that I directed the forum here. Because there was some question about the history of apostasy in the church. At that time, my good friend Al Rice was still alive sitting over there. I didn't even begin to think I needed to be talking about that. But Brother Rice has gone on to his reward. And we still appreciate him and think about him all this time, especially when we're here at the lectureship. Because the first time I ever met him, I was here. Well, we'll start with this question. I've got numerous, numerous, numerous questions. What should be our attitude towards lectureships and lectureship directors who invite men to speak who have spoken, who have gone or spoken with or for men who have been withdrawn from? Also, should we speak on programs with men who act like nothing is wrong when uh, with Ain't like nothing's wrong with men who have been withdrawn from. Well, it's not something I want to read, first of all. This doesn't prove anything, because what man writes doesn't prove anything except in as much as the scripture that he quotes proves something. April 1986 from the Defender. I don't know what kind of church historian you are, but in April 86, the Defender was edited by a man by the name of uh, Max Miller. And some of the followers of Miller have taken a different position from what I'm about to read to you. Uh, and this came at the top of the article, this commendation from the editor. The biblical doctrine of church discipline is being largely ignored, even violated without regard to consequence. Jimmy B. Hill has written two short articles calling attention to what has become a typical situation among brethren. Editor. So the editor commends this article, says this article represents the truth. Question, are you willing to fellowship a known crossroads type congregation that has been marked withdrawn from this fellowship by faith, sound faithful brethren? This is page 3, Defender, April 86. This is exactly what you'll be doing if the Highlands Church of Christ in Lakeland is allowed to participate in the 1986 Spiritual Growth Workshop along with you. The Church of Highland has been marked by the congregation at South Florida Avenue in Lakeland because of their fellowship with the Crossroads Church of Christ in Gainesville, their fellowship with the Boston Church of Christ, Crossroads Type, their endorsement of brother, uh, brothers, Rubber Shelley and Joe Beam, and views on fellowship, many more questionable practices, which there has been no repudiation or denial. And he goes on and he discusses why, uh, how this is done, quotes passages like 2 John 9 through 11, Romans 16, 17, and makes the point that you cannot fellowship an individual or a group of individuals that had been scripturally withdrawn from. Let me say, first of all, not all withdrawals are scriptural. For example, in Acts chapter 19, Paul was in Ephesus, and basically he was preaching in the synagogue, and the synagogue withdrew from him, if you will. They had no right to withdraw because they were not a New Testament church, and they did so unscripturally. Uh, in verse 9, he separated himself and he went and taught in the school of one Tyrannus, which is uh, the Latin word for tyrant, which in English is sometimes translated the school of Keith Mosier. <laughs> uh, in some translations, I understand. But uh, the answer to the question is no if the withdrawal is scriptural. Basically, fellowship is first horizontal then vertical. First John chapter 1 and verse 3. Uh, John tells us that basic point, that fellowship is first vertical and then it's going to be horizontal. He says, That which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you that, we may also have, that ye may also have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father. So the fellowship goes up before it goes out. And anyone who is in fellowship with the Father is my brother. I am in fellowship with him. Anyone who ceases to be in fellowship with the Father or has never been in fellowship with the Father, I have no fellowship with. Ephesians 5.11 is interesting. In the earliest manuscripts, Ephesians 5.11 is written in all capital letters. In the later manuscripts, written in small letters. So you might translate it this way. Have no big F or little F fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather we prove them. Actually, be big K or little K, I guess. But no fellowship means what? It means no fellowship. 
and our brother who has been withdrawn from, that means the church has recognized that God has withdrawn from him. And if the church recognizes that God has withdrawn from him and that is a correct assessment of the situation, then if God has no fellowship with him or two or three agree together in my name, I am in the midst of it, contextually that's talking about withdrawal, Matthew 18, 15 through 18. When God withdraws from that, I do not have the right to continue on. And I know I'm repeating what was said last hour, that's why I started with it, and you have to go quickly through that first question. Uh, let's see, that's everyone on the fellowship, so does anybody have anything to say? I figured I could tell him that's the right he needs to say anything, so we'll go on. Uh, we'll do this uh, situation, number, well, doesn't matter about the number. Could you speak on the one flesh doctrine? The premise that when one has sexual relations, they become married. Could you please refute this false doctrine? Well, Matthew 19 discusses marriage, and it says that what people are to do is to leave father and mother, cleave in their wife, and they too shall become one flesh. That is the biblical situation with regard to marriage. Now, some people teach that what happens is you find a woman, you bring her in, and you go before a judge, or you go before a court system, a legal system, you get a license. And that license then is taking your picture or someone like that. And then they stand up and they preach a sermon on marriage, oftentimes referring to many of the marriage passages in the New Testament. When they get through, they often will say this, I now pronounce you man and wife. And apparently some of these preachers have a little footnote that they don't let you see pending what goes on in the bedroom tonight. That's basically what they're saying. They're saying... We don't know for sure, but we think this is going to be. But they say, I now pronounce you man and wife. Even before you may kiss the bride, I now pronounce you man and wife. Romans 3 and verse 8 talks about some that reported that, that the church would do evil that good may come. Fornication is evil. Fornication would be the first act of this sexual relationship between two people not married to each other isn't that part of the definition of fornication then after that fornication takes place these people become married which Hebrews 13 says marriage is honorable you might say marriage is good so what they're saying is we may do evil, sin, fornication that good marriage may come that's refuted in Romans chapter 3 verse 8 we don't have to go any further than that and I guess we want us to have so many questions. There are some, I want to get another divorce question in. There are some who say that put away does not mean divorce. They claim that saying put away means divorce is added to the text, and that is just traditionally, that is just traditionally thought to be such. Can you comment on this? Thank you. In Matthew 19, the word translated put away is the word apolilo. It's a compound Greek word. The word luo is one if you've ever taken a Greek class you got sick of because it's the one that they keep on putting in all of the clenches and you have to tell what they are. Well, luo means to loose. Apo means, it's a preposition, it means away from. So you loose away, and it's translated in Matthew 19 in the King James Version, put away. A literal translation. Now that is a word. The reason that literal is used is number one because it's used so many times in the Corinthians in the New Testament. Number two, it's such a prominent word. It appears so many times in the New Testament in so many contexts. When you put it in context, you know what's being loosed. If that hero was up at old by plowing and he operated, you'd know that he you loosed his mule. And you know that's not talking about marriage. But if you put apolilo in context of marriage and there's a loosing away from that takes place, what do you know that is? That's a divorce. That's all. It's, it's not even that complicated. You just understand that word that is broad covers many things in a particular context. The context in Matthew 19 is not plowing. The context in Matthew 19 is marriage. And all you're doing is you're attempting to loose where God has bound and he says without fornication being committed that that is sin on both parts and if fornication is committed that's sin on at least one part. And that one person that is the party can then get remarried. Any comments on marriage and divorce? I know it's like when the kings go to war. Hope for them, you got to have marriage and divorce questions. 
good. You got something? Aren't you uh, speak also in relationship to the idea that you mentioned the putting away? It? Can the government put someone away without God doing it? And Can the must, government and and must God submit to what the government does? That gets into almost the next question. <laughs> that deals with several. Let me introduce the next question. And comment on both at the same time. Can Christians engage in civil disobedience to bring about a greater good, breaking the law of abortion clinics, e.g., such as breaking the law of abortion clinics? God and human law. God and all law. The, the medieval theologians used to have this discussion about whether God was what, what they called ex lex or sub lego. Word lex is the word for law. Is he outside of law or is he under? Law, and the basic answer to that is uh, there's a technical term in Latin, but basically God is the source of law. It's not that God, that law is out there restricting what God can and cannot do. It's not that God has created law arbitrarily. It's that law flows from His nature, and all we've got three divine institutions, correct? We've got the government, we've got the home, we've got the church. None of those three have a right to go contrary to God's law and rule in areas God has not delegated to them. For example, in Matthew 19, there is a discussion concerning our children, well, concerning marriage. And in Matthew 19, or excuse me, not Matthew 19, Matthew 21 concerning the coin. Whose image and superscription is on the coin? The question was concerning taxes. Jesus said, The one whose image and superscription is on the coin is the one who deserves it. Whose image is on Caesar's. He said, Therefore, render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's, unto God that which is God. Now let's go to our children. Whose image are they made in? Genesis chapter 1. God's. Whose name are they called by? When they become Christians, they're called by the name of Christ. To whom do those children belong then? They belong to God. I can't give them to the government then, can I? I'm not authorized to do so. I'm not authorized to hand those children over and tell the government you raise them. I'm not authorized to hand them over to the church and tell the church you raise them. Now our brethren not understand the government, but they don't understand the church. At least most of our brethren, who knows some of them probably don't understand either one. But the government has a role to play in a realm, Romans 13. They are not authorized to make laws that are contrary to God's laws. Now, God doesn't have a law on immigration, as far as I know. That, that has to do with the border of this nation, and it'd be wonderful we just follow the laws that we have on our books. But we don't. But they do have a right to make laws in that area, as far as I know, unless there's some scripture I haven't read. But when it comes to God's marriage law, tell me someone who legislates in that area. God. So the government can recognize God's law, and they should, but they're not authorized to violate God's law and to deviate from God's law. Now, if the government comes along and does that and deviates from what God has set forth in the Scripture, then the government has sinned just as surely as an individual who deviates from that law has sinned. And when we got into the no fault divorce and everything behind that, our government stepped in an area they had no business stepping into. Because in Catholic countries, I'm told that there's some Catholic countries where you can't even get a divorce, period, because their government has followed their Catholicism. And then you get what's called an annulment. Even, especially if you're a Kennedy and you've got grown children, you can get an enrollment from the Catholic Church. 
But God's law is superior to, anterior to, above man's law. And it rules in the church, it rules in the home, and it rules in the government. And that relates to both the question of marriage, which we just talked about, and God's law, when it's violated by government, individual, doesn't matter, it's not, it's not God's will that that be. And God does not, I don't pick the right word here, I almost said does not care, that's not a good word. God does care. But the government cannot force God, let's put it that way, to recognize things contrary to made law, such as two people go out and get married. And they have no right, whether it be heterosexual or homosexual, they're not candidates for marriage, and the government says that's a marriage. Does God have to recognize that? No. Any more than if some church somewhere else says we're going to put in one elder, and here's God's law on elders, husband of one wife, does God have to recognize that? No. So God's marriage law is above all other laws. It's above this law on abortion. Uh, did I deal with it? I don't know. <laughs> did I deal with it? I don't even know where I started, to be honest. <laughs> I confused myself. Let me deal with this abortion thing then, and I'll come back to it if I need to. Can Christians engage in civil disobedience? God's law is higher than man's law on abortion. Acts 5.29, why don't obey God rather than men? But here comes a situation where man's law, this, this, this law in our land says what? For example, it says you cannot protest within so many feet of an abortion clinic. What's the Christian's responsibility there? Let's ask this question. What is the goal? The goal is to make what stop in America? Abortion. Which by definition is a take in human life. Where, is, where do abortions come from? Not from poverty. That's not it. Matthew 15, 13 through 16, think that passage. Where do abortions come from? Murder comes from the heart. Abortion is a type, a form of murder. Then how are we going to stop abortion? By changing hearts. Not by blocking clinics, and especially not by blowing up clinics. And not by being engaged with those who would blow up clinics. Why don't we have bar protesters that stand outside bars and protest? Why is it one sin gets so out? I know it's an evil, I understand that. But we're going to ask the question at the end of the day, what have we done? Has anything changed? The, the, this country will not be changed top down. I hate to admit it, but it's true. The only way that the politicians at the top listen is when it comes bottom up. And we have the power in pulpits across this nation and in newspapers and in articles to change the hearts of people because the gospel is the only thing to change your heart. And if we want to end abortion, it's going to be by the word of God, not by standing in front of a clinic. Anything else on that? Let me uh, add, address it a little bit because uh, somebody was presenting some of these things to me uh, the other day. And my difficulty may be in answering part of it. Uh, if someone came and I saw them and they were fixing to kill this person or harm this person, would I have the right and the obligation to protect that person that is about to be killed? If so, mm -hmm. which I would say yes, we have that obligation. If so, here is a de defenseless child who is in the womb. Is it not our 
obligation thus and our right to defend that defenseless child in doing the action that is necessary to prevent the abortion. Back to your first question. As Brother Hightower pointed out in his excellent book on can a Christian be a policeman, would you not have the right in the first situation you drew not just to block access to the murderer, but to take lethal force to stop that murderer? Well, I would, that's why I was saying, yes, you would. You would. Then is, yeah. is it parallel <laughs> with the abortion situation when we would admit, I think, unless we're Operation Rescue, that we do not have the right. I shouldn't have said them out. Well, the I, was, I was going to mention Paul Hill, who uh, killed the abortion yeah. um, here, uh, abortionist here. What is the result of that? Did he stop any abortions? Let's ask that question. We've got to ask about it. Is it effective? Regardless of right and wrong, let's just ask that. Is it effective? Did he stop anything? He that abortions, but did he stop the abortions? <laughs> wait, please, he was, wait for um, <laughs> wait for the mind. Whoso sheds man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. Is that an obligation on that particular passage? Is, does, how does that play into this? Is this a governmental obligation under your new covenant when it's given, the sword's given in Romans 13 to who? The government. There's your punishment. And I'm all for getting the government to change bottom up so that people who do that go through the legal system and receive, as Paul would say in Romans 1, the just recompense of their, that, that's meet for their reward. Go ahead, Terry. Please. Isn't it, it's a little like the dealing with slavery in the New Testament, isn't it? And uh, We know that it was not uh, headed for a violent thing. He wants to keep it so he can take it back. Uh, he doesn't want me to take it over. Uh, that in slavery, we know that when you read about Onesimus in the book of Philemon and other places of Scripture coupled with it, the total context of the Bible will do away with slavery. Mm -hmm. And I think it did. It wasn't just people like Wilberforce in England. It was the Bible and through men like him who got slavery in Britain stopped and ultimately, of course, it took like how many lives in America and a war to end up uh, at least involved in it stopping it. But it, it's a thing where Romans 12, there's a lot of principles involved here. And as much as in you life, be at peace you know, with all men, if possible. And so you are. You're not looking, Mike is not looking to get in or any of us on those situations to have to step in. Sometimes we do step in. It's like a school teacher is in loco parentis. Some people just say school teachers to teach today's kids are just loco. But anyway, uh, that you are in place of the parent. The, te the teacher is taking the parent's place. In a sense, that's what you're doing. If you step in in a not even just self-defense for yourself, you are doing it even then. You become the policeman for yourself. And when you step in to stop someone from fighting, you're doing something a policeman ought to be doing while he's there. Paul said in Acts 25, you know, he said that he's there before the uh, Caesar's judgment seat where he says, where I ought to be judged. And there's what you've mentioned already of this uh, separation of these things. But it's not so easy as what we're dealing with here as to application. I agree with you that it does backfire in the long term of it just, just like about slavery, that Paul and others and Jesus did not say, go out here and kill people right and left to stop slavery. But the Bible ultimately taught will stop slavery and it will stop abortions, you know, too. I would say this, what do we say to a nurse who's a member of the church? Can she just without with impunity go right on, hand me the scalpel, and, and go ahead and take this baby's life when she knows this is an innocent child. I do not believe she can do that. And, uh, and then when we vote people in, you know, because of all kinds of other things we like, like the way the economy is going, rather than dealing with these moral issues, that's what upset me so much about where I don't actually kill a child, but by pulling a lever, I'm putting people in there where you have these judges who rule exactly you know, the wrong way. But you're absolutely correct about the Bible teaches that uh, the God is supreme here. Uh, and we've had some rounds recently, some of us, about that to do with marriage. We tried to show 
there is a civil sense in which you're married to someone, but there is the triangle this way to where we're, we are locked in with God's law about marriage, and He's the one who truly joins us together. Jesus was not, Jesus was not binding Palestinian law even though in Matthew 5, as you know, he talks about, they ask him about the bill of divorcement. Well, in some countries, they don't even fool with that. Like I've read about African countries, they just jump over a bed of hot coals holding hands and they're married. Of course, it's pretty neat to get divorced. You just hold hands and jump backwards over it and you're divorced now. But anyway, no bill of divorcement. Each country does its own cultural thing. I think you alluded to that a while ago. Oh, the only abortion thing, too. God is supreme. Something I didn't mention I should have. In the first century, you mentioned slavery. In the first century, abortions were taking place. Not inside the womb, but what they would do, they would cast the baby out after. And in fact, uh, this was as the, the uh, situation with the Catholic Church got going, but they started taking in some of these babies and raising them up because... because that's the way that they dealt with it. They didn't go try to overthrow the government, and they didn't kill the parents, but they did what they could in their cultural context to do the best way to get that situation changed. Okay, is it right to pull the plug on a terminally ill patient? Uh, we all, from time to time, if, if, if you live long enough and situation comes along, everyone in this audience, one way or another, probably will be touched by this question. And this is a question that needs to be decided and preached on and discussed, I think, more than it is. It's a question that needs to be decided before the emotions of a particular situation come in. What is my right, what is my responsibility? Turn with me, if you will, to Second Samuel chapter 1. Now understand that the family in 2 Samuel 1 does not represent the story of 1 Samuel 28 exactly correct. But the point I want to make out of 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel 1 is how does a man after God's own heart deal with assisted suicide? Because that's what he understands happens because this fellow makes a confession to that effect. It came to pass after the death of Saul, David was returned from the slaughter of the Amalekites. He rode two days in Ziklag. It came to pass on the third day, a man came to the camp, his clothes rent, earth on his head. And David said to him, From whence comest thou? He said, I of the camp of Israel am I escaped. Remember, David's an outlaw at this time uh, from Saul. David said to him, uh, uh, How went the matter? How did the battle go? I pray thee, tell me. He said, The people are fled, and many of the people are fallen and dead. Saul and Jonathan are dead also. So David says to the young man, How knowest thou that Saul and Jonathan his son are dead? The young man told him and said, As I happened by chance upon Mount Gilboa, behold, Saul leaned upon his spear and rode the chariots and horsemen uh, following hard after him. And he looked behind him, he saw me and called me, and he answered and said, Here am I. He said, Who art thou? I said, I'm an Amalekite. He said, Stand, I pray thee, upon me and slay me, for anguish has come upon me, because my life is yet whole in me. What he said was Saul said I was I was I was in bad shape I was going going to die and I, and he said that, that he saw asked me the Amalekites to to finish the job so I stood upon him and slew him because I was sure that he could not live. There's your terminal situation. After he was fallen. And I took the crown upon his head and so forth. David took hold of his clothes. They mourned. They wept. David said, uh, Where are you from? He said, I'm an Amalekite. I'm a stranger. David said in verse 16, Thy blood be upon thine own head, for thy mouth was testified against thee, saying, I have slain the Lord's anointed. So here is a case of a terminal, at least as far as David understood it, a terminal patient asking for Dr. Jack the Amalekite to finish the job. Well, the man after God's own heart said, you are guilty of murder. Now, terminally ill. This gets into a whole deep study that's at least two weeks since in his Michael sermon. There is, <laughs> there is, there are things that are called active 
euthanasia, the word euthanasia doesn't mean kids in Korea, it means a good, literally a good death. There's active euthanasia, there's passive euthanasia. Active euthanasia is where I take the sword, I take the, the uh, needle, and I stick it in someone's arm. Passive euthanasia is where I allow another person to die. As you talk about active euthanasia, since this passage definitely deals with that. Passive euthanasia, where I allow someone to die, we've got to ask this one question. And it, will my actions, if I intervene in a situation, prolong life or prolong death? Will my intervention prolong life or will it prolong death? If my intervention prolongs death, then I need to step back and say, is that what God would have me to do in this situation? And I'm not going to pass judgment and tell you if it's your life and your mother with that situation. Talking about the past, I'm not talking about active euthanasia. God has spoken clearly on that. But there's a lot of things that, for me to even begin to comment on your specific case, I would have to know that I can't know, especially not in open forum. It's things you wouldn't even want to tell in open forum. But when we're dealing with active euthanasia, we're dealing with sin. That's what happened to you. When we when we ask ourselves the question, what extraordinary means? should be taken to prolong death slash prolong life, then we've got to get into what are extraordinary means. What is extraordinary? Is a feeding tube an extraordinary means? Is, is, is another kind of medicine extraordinary means? That's, those things need to be discussed and decided long before I wind up in a hospital. This brother uh, McDaniel mentioned this morning, you may tie your shoes in the morning. The undertaker may untie them at night. And these things need to be decided in advance. Uh, I will say this. They've got this thing they call an advance directive. Those things are up there. Right here in Florida, uh, the governor has intervened in a case with a particular lady who she is not, as far as I've been able to determine, she's not terminally ill. She's just not recovering to the extent that people feel she should recover as far as quality of life. That's my understanding of the case. And uh, the governor, governor, Jeb Bush, intervened and said that her husband, now listen to the whole, I know this part's true, her husband, who is living with another woman in the house they used to live in, and wanting to marry her as soon as the lady passes away, and wants to keep the inheritance that he received as a result of his wife's unfortunate demise, that he did not have the right to do that. Now the federal courts have intervened. And unfortunately, that's where we are in our world. I don't want to offend anybody. But Shakespeare said, kill all lawyers. <laughs> and uh, he was a smart man. I don't know about all. We might need one or two left. Bud Swain is one. He's a good one. Anybody got any comments on that? Go ahead. But Gary, he's a brilliant man in this area, I know. Can I request you go ahead and talk a little Aspect of quality of life and the argument around that aspect. Okay. This doesn't alter your point, but in 1 Samuel 31, verse 5, when his armor bearer saw that Saul was dead, he likewise fell on his sword and died with it. The Amalekite was lying. Yes, Amalekite was lying. Happened. And, uh, but it doesn't alter your point yeah. at all. I just wanted to make that clarification. Yeah, that's what I said in the beginning. That this does not represent what actually happened in 1 Samuel 28. But it represents what the, 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 judge, the future king and judge of Israel, who was a man after God's own heart at this point, felt like should be the situation. On the uh, 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 quality of life issue, uh, most people would say that, that I probably don't even have a good quality of life. <laughs> well, I said most people. I didn't say anybody out. No, it could, she probably would say the same thing. Uh, but in fact, my quality of life just went down just then. But uh, 
Uh, quality of life, number one, that's difficult for anyone to determine. Number two, why not, if we're going to say at the end of life, if a person cannot do X, his quality of life is reduced to the point that he should not be allowed to live, then we need to put them to death when that happens, when they're six months old, eight months old, whatever. Also along that line of the quality of life question, uh, you've got people out there in the federal government that are headed toward not passive euthanasia, but active euthanasia. Uh, I don't know how much you read of a health care bill that was attempted to be passed about 94, but let's say any time you hear from a politician's lips that the problem is all the money spent at the, in the last year of a person's life, if you're an old person, you better get scared and you better quit voting for people that say that. Go ahead, Lee. Lee Davis, across from Tennessee. Um, out of a personal situation, uh, prior to the 21st of August last year, um, my father and our family had sat down and decided uh, that he did not want a, he wanted a no resuscitate order. DNR. And the 21st of August, he fell into a coma and uh, stopped breathing. They could not find the papers. So they intervened. He was on the ventilator. Uh, but the reason I'm saying this <clears throat> is that uh, when he came out of that uh, situation, which he did, and he regained uh, a portion of health that uh, he changed his life around. Of course, he died the 27th of February this year. So sometimes the conventional wisdom, uh, if we were to follow that, it wouldn't be for the greater good on some of those things. Sometimes Providence seems to enter in, at least apparently. Let's see. Realizing, oh, I really want to get to two more at least. Realizing the use of instruments or something when singing religious songs, is it wrong to sing other types of songs, patriotic songs, love songs, i.e. God bless America, which invoke the name of God with an instrument? Well, I don't have time to get into this, but let me just say this. If the Supreme Court says, God bless America, it's not religious. I just agree with them for now. Uh, it, surely these folks, if, if there's any vestige of religion in the song, they're going to find it and they're going to rule against it in our world today. Invoking the name of God does not. Now, I'm not saying, I'm not talking about comfortable. I'm not talking about that. Here's a hard, fast rule that I have on determining these quote unquote questionable songs, or these songs have spiritual songs. If the song leader got up on Sunday night and read it, would I get would it bother me if he led it in worship? If it bothers me when he when he leads it in worship, then maybe it ought to be out there and not in worship. That's kind of the way that I look at it. Everybody's got their view on this. I just happened to express mine because I happen to be standing here. Okay, this is two together I want to get to. Uh, are those who are baptized according to, uh, according to the Christian church, denomination, our brethren in Christ? And how much does one need to know about the church, if anything, prior to his baptism? Well, in uh, Acts chapter 8, the Bible says, And when they believed Philip, preaching the things concerning, point number one in the sermon, the kingdom of God, Point number two in the sermon, the name of Jesus Christ. Point number three, they were baptized, uh, they were baptized both men and women. The kingdom of God is the church. They believed Philip and what Philip said about the church before they were baptized. They believed what Philip said about the authority of Christ. As far as I know today, the Christian church does not believe nor practice the authority of Christ. They have rejected that. In the debate, higher breaks of debate, they said, forget it, we don't need authority. And that was their champion at the time. When it comes to denominationalism, that's what they are. A few questions along this line. Number one, is the Christian church a denomination? Yes. yes. Number two, is denominationalism sin? Yes. Number three, must we return our sins before we're baptized? Yes. Okay, that's a pretty good inductive Situation, and I think Brother Terry could explain it in a deductive way. 
That's a pretty good inductive situation. They are not the Lord's church. I'm not talking about some isolated example of a person who read his Bible, learned from his Bible. But this deals with a person who has been taught the Christian church doctrine. I think fell out there, out there in uh, uh, San Mateo, California, even. It didn't know Joe Gilmore or anyone like him. Can read his Bible and say, hey, I need to obey this. And could get someone to baptize him who might be uh, one of those bells on the streets. Because he says this way, then the Lord ran in his church. But if he is taught and believes Christian church doctrine, then he has not been scripturally baptized. Any comments on that? Amen. Thank you. Is that it? That's it.